Okay. Welcome everyone to our fifth session of our six month biocontrol technical workshop series of the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan. Most of you who have followed the series from the start will know that my name is Alison and I'm very pleased to be back and moderating this session. And I'm joined by four uh, experts to speak on what is a very important but sometimes overlooked topic. Uh, and that is farmer acceptance of biocontrol and scale up issues. Uh, and for everyone who can't travel at the moment, but would really like to, uh, make sure your seat is in the upright position, seatbelt fastened, and that you're ready for takeoff. Because we have a very busy agenda today and it's going to be split into four presentations. The good thing is there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers with our experts. Before we start, I just want to run through really quickly how to use the Zoom platform. I'm sure you all know this, but just a reminder that if you have questions, which we love to have and hear from, um, please put those in the Q&A box. Um, really important to try and put them in there so we can collect them together. Um, and if you wanna make general comments, share your research, tell us what you're doing, say thank you to one of the speakers or praise them for their outstanding presentation, you can write that in the chat. We love to have that conversation as well. Um, if you can change your name, rename yourself to just make sure it's your correct name. And if you've got an organization, you can put that in as well. You just do that by clicking the more box up there and pressing rename. And just another reminder that this is our fifth session in a six month workshop series. The series is hosted by Grow Asia under the ASEAN Action Plan and supported by experts and organizations from across the region and the world. And participation is open to everyone. We really want to hear from you. So please keep um, emailing me. I, I get lots of emails. I really want to hear your success and failures. Um, and very soon next week, we'll be actually having a website up and running where you'll be able to share and talk on the forum and tell us what you're doing so it's not up today but it will be up next week and I will be contacting all of you with an email just to say this is where it is and we're so excited to hear from you so that'll be next week and here's the taster of the topics already covered under the series what's coming up um, don't miss our session uh, the next session is on the 8th of April uh, where we move to our biopesticide uh, discussion on biopesticide trials and I'm just going to run a poll before we introduce our first speaker. And it's, it's these questions are not meant to be scientifically rigorous. They're also anonymous answers. It's just a fun way to start. So give it your best shot. Uh, and if you really don't know any names of biopesticides, you can safely choose zero because it's anonymous. Uh, so be honest if you can there. You don't have to. You don't have to pretend that you know all of them, or if you're a world's expert on it, you can put 10 plus as well. So you've got three questions there. I'll give you a little bit of time to answer those. The first question there is, do you think smallholder farmers need more education on how to incorporate biocontrol into crop management? The second question is, in general, are biopesticides too expensive for smallholder farmers to use? And the third question is, how many biopesticides can you name? You've got a range there. And we, we're getting the answers in now. We, I'm going to, oh, we're already 52% have voted. You better get in there. If you haven't already started, well, we've definitely, oh, we've got some experts on biopesticides in the room as well. And I, it, because it's anonymous, I'm not going to select those 10, uh, those those nine percent of people, eight people that uh, know 10 plus biopesticides by name. So so you're so you're really lucky. <laughs> and I'm going to give you another. Oh, I'm going to get to 100 people, I think, or well, maybe 75 percent. Oh, we're getting fast, uh, and I'm going to close the poll. and share results. And you'll see there, do you think smallholder farmers need more education on how to incorporate biocontrol into crop management? 84%, yes, a great deal more. Uh, and another 15, yes, a little more. So, so that's, we're showing there what we think is needed out there uh, with our farmers. In general, are biopesticides too expensive for smallholder farmers to use? Now, this is really interesting. 50% um, think yes but 30% know and another 19% don't know. So, th so there's actually quite an interesting discussion piece 
Uh, maybe Siang he maybe uh, one of our speakers might be able to sort of talk about that a bit later. Um, how many biopesticides can you name? We've got lots in the room that can actually name one or more. So so that is actually really good as well. So between one to three biopesticides by name is about fifty six percent of you. Okay, great. What we're going to do now is move on to our first speaker. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge before we start uh, the generous help by Dr. Roger Day from Cabby and his team in helping to coordinate today's session. Roger has been a really a huge support throughout the series and he was very keen to present today, uh, but has lost his voice, possibly in the excitement uh, of organising this session, I, I think. Um, but however, we're very lucky to welcome the capable Dr. Fong Zhang from Cabby to start our presentation. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Edison, for your nice words. Um, uh, my name is Feng Zhang uh, from KB China. Uh, as Edison mentioned, um, it's my great pleasure uh, and honor uh, to present this presentation on behalf of KB team uh, to give a short introduction and overview of this workshop. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, everyone talks about IPM and the Laos biologicals. Uh, of course, IPM was even uh, pioneered in rice in Indonesia, in this region. Uh, but uh, when you look at what's happening on the ground, that when far what farmers actually do, uh, especially like uh, for animal counts, uh, they often try to pesticide. Uh, pesticide. Uh, here I have two, uh, two graphs. Uh, in the left graph, uh, this is our farmer survey in two counties uh, in southwestern China uh, that showed significant significant increase of chemical pesticides uh, expenditure uh, on maize uh, on maize crops uh, after for animal invasion in China. Uh, in the right uh, graph, uh, there's another KB research in Ghana and Zambia uh, also showed the similar trend uh, that 60 to 70 percent of farmers. Uh, was using chemical pesticides uh, for firearm control in 2017. Uh, so therefore, we have to admit that actually implementation of biological controls on uh, large scales isn't so straightforward. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, why do farmers like use pesticides? Uh, here, I want to show a, a paper uh, that the KB did in Kenya. Uh, published in pest management science. Um, that's uh, the graph in, the, in this slide uh, in, the, uh, in the left hand, show the farmers we use on the biopesticides and pesticides. Uh, in summary, uh, that farmers know biologicals are safe, uh, but rarely use them. Uh, there are some reasons behind that pesticides are perceived to be cheaper, uh, broad spectrum, more easily available, uh, quick to work, and even more effective. Uh, so getting farmers uh, to use biologicals is much more complicated uh, than just telling them uh, how safe they are. Uh, so we need to, we need to work. Uh, we need to work together to develop uh, effective uh, biologicals, uh, particularly for the researchers to approve, uh, to find the evidences uh, that that uh, how efficient, how effective are the biologicals in the field? Uh, we we need to we need to make, of course, biological available and affordable. Uh, those are two elements quite important. And this will involve not only research, uh, actually, it's more about uh, policy, regulatory, and private sector. Uh, of course, uh, just as just as we see from the pool in the beginning. That, that farmers' uh, lack of knowledge need more training, uh, need more education. So we need to communicate, we need to train them uh, to build their awareness and the knowledge on how to political uh, works. Uh, so they don't, they don't always compare this with chemicals because there, there are certain different uh, uh, characteristics of these two type, two type of control measures. So here, I believe extension and the communication uh, are very important. Next slide, please. Uh, this, just, this is uh, about the, our plant-wise program in Myanmar. 
Uh, I believe some of the colleagues are also sit here, uh, particularly from PBD. Uh, so the survey uh, also should report that lack of knowledge among farmers is the ranked as the number one uh, major challenge for adoption of biologicals. Uh, other main challenge, of course, also include uh, it takes too much time to apply, a lack of support, lack of inputs. Uh, so uh, these are quite common, I think, not only for Myanmar, but also for other countries in the region. So all these sounds a bit familiar. And, uh, and uh, but so, so what's the next? Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a flow chart of the developing uh, cost-effective biology control products from the beginning of discovery uh, to the end of, uh, uh, let's say, the registered product uh, comes to the market uh, for farmers to use. Uh, the message here is that, uh, you see, production development is always a very uh, lengthy and also a very expensive process. Uh, many researchers, like myself, uh, mostly are respond, let's say, are involved in the beginning stage of discovery. And of course, they, sometimes after some trials, we found a good, good we found some good results, uh, but maybe it's not enough actually. And also, they actually, this is just the uh, easiest part. So, uh, so sometimes that uh, we need to go a little bit further uh, behind this field trials. Uh, to make sure that there's actually there are lots of other important uh, in, uh, in the commercialization process. Uh, but maybe often the research doesn't go that far. Uh, that's maybe some reasons, either because of funding, uh, time, or the mandate of the research. So next slide, please. So in a short summary, uh, the main point is that you see different actors need to understand each other's context. Uh, need to think in a different way that how to bring all these sectors uh, together, to work together, uh, to come along together, to make the biologicals, uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, uptaken by the farmers. Uh, of course, it's more complicated than what I'm seeing now. They need lots of more work. Uh, so, uh, so I believe today's workshop is really a good platform, a good platform to address these issues, to bring these issues uh, from, the dif from different uh, perspectives. Uh, so this is kind of uh, open the door, hopefully. I'm confident that the speakers uh, today, uh, Dr. Tan from Crop Life Asia, uh, Dr. Manjuta from India, and Rika from Riri, uh, will give the, uh, some good let's say innovative ideas or some food for thoughts uh, that to uh, promote the biological control. Uh, so thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. And I've got quite a lot of different things open at the moment because I'm looking at the questions as well. Just remember everyone, if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A box. And uh, we do have some questions for you. Um, so uh, the first question, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Uh, and, and just thank you very much for that introduction as well. I mean, I think you actually, uh, talked about a number of important points and one of the questions I have is you showed that flow diagram there of the sort of development pathway and yeah. I could even go back to it because I'm quite interested in this and one thing that I'm quite interested in asking you is how can we incorporate the farmer more into that development research and development process because we sort of see the farmer gets mentioned in the packaging distribution and marketing uh, at the very end but I wonder mm -hmm. if there's a need uh, actually even before the discovery around uh, encouraging researchers uh, to understand what farmers' needs are from the very start and what works for farmers. What what do you think about that? Uh, that's yeah, it's a good question. I I believe I believe that uh, let's say the biological control solutions in the beginning has to come from the field. Why we are doing this? Uh, what kind of pest problems we want to address actually to meet farmers' uh, let's say needs 
uh, to manage the pest. Uh, so, uh, so for, for I think for the researcher, of course, uh, the the questions comes from the field, comes from the farmers themselves. Yeah. Uh, of course, in, in, during the process, uh, we should involve farmers in the field. Uh, for example, a field trials to demonstrate how effective, efficient uh, the biological solutions uh, to the farmers. Yeah. And, and is that happening, do you think, or do you think that could happen more in your experience? Uh, you might be Yes, of course. Uh, in the beginning, maybe less because the, we want to get to the get the choice under control normally. Uh, so, so maybe less involved. But of course, in the uh, in the later stage, if you want to uh, to have more uh, uh, to increase your uh, your coverage, your your your, uh, your repeat, rep, you, you have to repeat. You know, in different region, different area. So you have to get the farmers involved to cooperate with you. Uh, because of the, the field trial had to be done on farms, I think, uh, yeah. rather, than, uh, rather than research stations. Okay. There's a question here from Mohim Khan. Uh, how can we convince farmers of, um, of this work uh, when they've not yet uh, accepted or understand much about biological control? What, what's the first way that we can approach farmers to, to educate them and encourage them to use biocontrol? Uh, I believe that, let's say, uh, each country and uh, even the, uh, let's say, government agencies, community extension agencies uh, has had lots of experience how to deal with the farmers on the training. Uh, of course, uh, KB, uh, our own organization has a plant clinic, uh, plant uh, let's say, plant clinic program. Uh, we, we encourage using multimedia approach, uh, radios, every, newspapers, everything that's the training materials, you know, in farmers' language. Uh, but of course, FU has a farmer field school approach, uh, how to train the farmers through the season. So yeah. there are lots of ways we have to uh, maybe to adapt to the local conditions. Yeah. Uh. Excellent. And he here's another question uh, that's just come in. There are a lot of available protocols uh, in creating a homemade biopesticide online. Could these protocols be validated, optimized and transferred or shared to a community of farmers as a package of technology? Uh, rather than waiting for the optimized biopesticide protocol to become a registered product? Uh, I, I have to say maybe it depends on the country, I think, uh, if, uh, what's regulation there. Uh, in certain cases, it's possible, but in some cases, I think the, pro the quality is very important because we have to be careful when, when, the, when such a homemade brood uh, is not so effective, let's see. So the farmers might lose the confidence in biological uh, solutions. That, that's my concerns. Otherwise, of course, do, you have to look. Yeah. Do you think uh, there is though? I mean, I think some people think because it's a biopesticide that it's entirely safe. Um, but there are safety, I guess, concerns sometimes even with biopesticides. Just because they have the bio in front of them doesn't necessarily mean they are safe. Is that true? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. For some products, we have to be careful. <laughs> Uh, botanical pesticides like neem products, we might have to think about non-target effects. Uh, even for the for the parasitoids, actually, uh, uh, in case of classical bug control, you have to do by safety test by uh, whose specificity test to exclude uh, those have a broader host range to attack non you know, to attack other other pests or even um, even beneficial ones. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, I believe. Yes. okay, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but I'm going <laughs> to ask you anyway, but, and, and I can ask some of our next speakers as well, but what, in your opinion, is one of the most successful biopesticides to manage fall armyworm? Do you, do you, can you answer that? Or do you think we need uh, more information or? Okay, maybe I need more, maybe from other uh, assistant. It depends on the region. Of course, from, my, from China, we, at, at the moment, we have two bypassed products uh, already registered. Uh, yep. Mine's BT. Uh, it's, uh, I, think, uh, I think Professor John from IPBCAS uh, did a give a presentation in the early webinar uh, for that product. Uh, there's also another product uh, based on metarizing uh, uh, fungal, fungal pathogens. So that works very well. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And I think you, you mentioned this before, just the, the different ways um, you can work with farmers. Have you seen any particularly successful ways of communicating to farmers? I, I think you said multimedia or, or different styles. 
Is there anything that you've seen that's been particularly effective? Is it the plant clinics or is it the field farmer schools or are there sort of things that work the best? Okay, in- I, I cannot uh, say, of course, I, I, because I'm a, cab, I'm, I'm a KB person, I love plant clinic. Of course. Uh, but, but, now, uh, we have to consider farm, uh, it depends on the conditions. Uh, nowadays, farmers might have more other things, you know, rather than they make more money from other, uh, other business. So, so it's really uh, had to look at local conditions. Uh, so for me, uh, for, for certain condition, plant clinic would work well that you hand you hand the professional uh, people to deal with the pest problems. Uh, you, you don't need to train farmers or to see uh, everybody to be an expert in my opinion, yeah. No, no, that's that's very good feedback. No, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much uh, for your presentation. We may come back at the end uh, for a few quick questions, um, but we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, But thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang, for for that presentation and that introduction. It set the scene very well. Uh, So it is my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Siangi Tan, who is currently Executive Director of CropLife Asia, and today is going to talk to us about the growing interest in biopesticides uh, and give an industry view on that market, and he may actually be able to uh, answer some of our questions before or have an opinion on that. Uh, Siangi, can you uh, unmute yourself, and if you'd like to put on your camera, you're you're most welcome. Unmute and wait. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, Alison, thank you again for, for um, inviting me to speak today on the biopesticide issue. You actually got me scrambling back to my university days uh, because my first graduate project was on um, bacterial fudge, which I was uh, screening for, um, for against um, Pseudomonas solanocerium was my first program. The second program when I went to Japan, was a um, attenuated virus that we fully uh, launched onto the field and is effective and is right now still um, being used um, in Japan as we speak and help protect the melon industry. So those are the two, two um, R&D piece that go to market that I have uh, that I can probably share later on. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, I work for CropLife. Uh, next slide, please. I, uh, Crop Life Asia, um, as we pull out the slides, uh, is a nonprofit organization that promotes uh, plant science innovation where our members are from BSF, Koteva, Syngenta, Bay FMC, Sumitomo, that we continue to invest about $6 billion um, into R&D to bring technology into the hands of farmer areas. And But for Crop Life Asia, uh, we are globally, we have 91 uh, offices and in Asia, 15, and we continue to work hand in hand with different stakeholders to ensure that we deliver technology into the hands of farmers. Next slide, please. And the vision uh, for us is to ensure that farmers are enabled with the technology that we have and innovate to allow farmers to continue to feed an increasing population. Food security is um, very important in Asia and how do we enable true innovative agriculture to ensure safe and secure food throughout Asia Pacific. And you're seeing this uh, more critically over the last 12 months when we had uh, COVID. So next slide, please. So the biological sector, and then um, Alison, you spoke about this very intensely to just now, and then Dr. Zhang also. So year to date, there are about 600 synthetic um, AIs in the market. But over the last couple of years, we have seen a dramatic increase in the biopesticide has been registered um, throughout. And then, of course, there's a wide scope in terms of uh, organism, active substance that has been increased. But uh, what in the integrate part is the farmers are looking for a more collective or cohesive toolbox that they could deal with pests and diseases. And this goes hand in hand with pest resistance management and also through rotation as they move from different mode of action from a crop protection domain into a biological domain. So this will allow the, what you call farmers to continue to have a yield increase con- uh, possibility, quality improvement, and back to then to the today's talking for its traceability of fresh producers. So this will continue to allow the farmers to produce and capture what they have planted in terms of value capture end of the day. So next slide, please. This slide shows you a, a um, span of from 1962 until 2017, 
the number of active ingredient of uh, crop protection product that's been registered. And what we show is that over the years, the number of biologic tests also increased dramatically over the last couple of years. Of course, we all know but BT is the number one seller. Today, we have six, almost 67 BT products in the market, 450 formulation, and contributes for 90, billion in, uh, 90 million into the market. Depending. And of course, there's other trips, white fly, uh, Lepidoptera, and, and different organisms that have been put into biocon. So, so just a span of it that this essentially is the key market is driven by BT. Next slide, please. So again, um, showing to you where most of the uh, biocontrol is right now is more derived from natural chemical as number one. Number two for pest control is predominantly dominated by insecticide, um, cidal effect. And then of course, nutrition is more the additive and then nematicide. So just want to share with you and also North America seems to be much more developed in terms of market acceptance. And of course it goes in tandem with the farmer's knowledge and We'll talk about farming later on because we raised a couple of questions on, on farming and education, etc. So that is a core component. How are we going to reach out to a number of extreme number of farmers across Asia Pacific, educate them and how to bring them on board in adoption of the technology. Next slide, please. So again, uh, potentially we are seeing uh, biologists increasing more than 10% year on year by 2025. There are different numbers. People say the market could be 3.7. I've seen numbers to about $4.5 billion. But just to share with you, essentially, it's a growing market because of different uh, adaptation. And we're coming from a very low, um, uh, what you call, position. And therefore, you're going to continue to see larger adaptation of the technology. Next slide, please. So this is just a market share. I'm not going to go into detail, but just, again, North America. Um, has quite a largest uh, market size. Next slide, please. Now, going back to the fundamental, you asked a question, is FAW, um, has, does FAW has a biopesticide solution? Yes, to a certain extent. Um, Dr. Zhang talked about metabolism that was uh, registered and BT is also one. So there are spectrum of things that uh, we know about 16 species of endopathogen that uh, can our uh, FAW is susceptible too, but nevertheless, there are things that we really need to work on. China was the first one that actually went on registration, but there are other pieces according to the FAO uh, 2017 report that there needs some more R&D in country where it's uh, to find that the both biova or pathova efficacy um, species specific that uh, Dr. Zhang also talked about just now. So, some of the local developmental work uh, for the industry, what we call developmental work of field trial needs to happen more on a systematic way and then on a larger scale to find solutions for the other countries that are currently being impacted by FAW uh, over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. So the challenges, again, uh, we spoke about this just now, you spoke about cost. We need to also learn, you know, from Asia Pacific context, there's tremendous weather patterns, stability and efficacy on the ground. So farmers are very, very accustomed to seeing um, an insect fall off the plant or, um, you know, just to explain. But therefore, uh, we need to teach them a different methodology to IPM from surveillance. So that's the new thing that we need to teach and reach out to them, how to monitor and also look at threshold and then when to apply and how to apply. Of course, there are different formulations that we in, is in the market. We also need to them in terms of shelf life stability. And also there are different products that has different, uh, what is called even for BT, there are different um, CFU um, that is in different bottles. So there's a lot of training that needs to be gone to, meaning needs to be um, extend to the farmers on how to use it correctly and how do you monitor for efficacy and efficiency on the ground. So still a lot of work uh, ongoing, but we can talk a bit more later. Next slide, please. So the R&D challenge, again, Dr. Zhang did the platform. Um, from an R&D perspective and going to market with the ex embedded uh, safety requirement, allergy test, and the multivariate, uh, whether it's from uh, shelf life stability, and then et cetera, there needs a whole lot of investment that the university currently may not have the capability or the funding based on R&D to go to market. 
So that's why it's a, a, a lot of things you're seeing. Um, I've seen people like Trichoderma, for example, is gone from a semi uh, lab stage to a pilot scale. And then how do we get it upskill? Whether there's a bioreactor, 100 liter bioreactor available, how do we do packaging? Again, packaging from a crop protection uh, pipeline and a biotech pipeline will be slightly different. Is there a facility for us to go upskill and does the university wants to upskill it or not? So those are some of the R&D. Yes, we have shown good uh, progress on the ground in the lab, in the report, but going to market, it's a whole different story altogether. Next slide. So going to market is, you found a good product, it's effective, we can control. Now the next part is, again, Dr. Zhang did hold all the platform is regulation. The major constraint is, are we able to get that data requirement? That's why, you know, for us in the crop protection side, we spend hundred over million dollars to get one product from R&D, from the early screening of target all the way to market is for $180 million. Um, that incorporates the registration process, um, getting the IP, doing all the uh, toxicology studies. So it is not a small amount. And again, Alison, you said just now, can I just have a tank, do myself and grow it up? Yes, but the problem is, um, if you have contaminant growing it, you're not growing the bacteria that you want, or you're not growing the organism that you want, you're gonna have a lot of mixture in terms of efficacy, uh, uh, effectiveness, and then losing effective at the day. And then, then the farmer will have it, it's at stake for losing his crop that he will not be able to protect his cultivation to, by using that pesticide and he will lose interest and be having a very different image of biopesticide. So that's that a watch out. So the other piece is IPR, it's a big constraint. Um, India is one good example is this purest pesticide. A lot of biopesticide is unlegally um, um, uh, mixed with active ingredient and therefore selling under biopesticide. But essentially we will be causing another outbreak later on because of resistance increase because um, there are different active ingredients being pumped into a, a biopesticide and the farmer doesn't know what is being sprayed onto the plant. So this is the other piece on the IP that we are superly concerned, especially on India regulation. Next slide, please. So India again has is one of the uh, best biopesticide regulation. They have uh, taken OECD guideline evolved and a PMB 2020 is really currently being tabled in Lok Sabha and it's due for, for, um, for parliament review. But nevertheless, it's one or it allows India's biopesticide regulation to further strengthen. And over the last couple of years, GIZ has been the frontier uh, in driving some of the ASEAN guideline on regulation use and trade of biological control agents. This is one first initiative that we're trying to get ASEAN countries coming together and say, can we agree on a sort of um, balance uh, requirement or how do we bring, register the product in the market? What is the basic requirement? So this is still work in progress, but I'm happy that uh, GIZ took the lead uh, with the support of FAO. And then it is now on the table by various ASEAN country. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we can see a much more uh, harmonized framework that uh, both even the natural, what they call universities, small stakeholders, and et cetera, can take their product to market and register for use and benefit the society, uh, the farming community at large. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, you know, EP, US EPA has one of the la uh, longest and most stabilized regulation in place. I think that's an opportunity for us to learn either from US EPA and OECD and allow other countries to jump on board, be able to let products register online uh, sorry, meaning come online and get products registered in a much more scientific way. Going back is again, data requirement. What are the data requirements that I can utilize whether it's biology, efficacy, and stability test that is recognized by the countries that we are selling to? But a lot of people say, oh, how come uh, this product is only registered for China? Because if it's going out from China to another country, it requires a whole lot of different uh, requirements. And then not to forget because of the um, sensitivity and biosafety, the safety protocol that we are, we are, you know, that is put in place by various uh, governments. So the whole process will be much more challenging. For example, uh, what you call uh, the 
Australian regulation for biosafety, uh, Quarantine Act for Biological Control Act, Environmental Protection Biodiversity Act. So when you go to market, you have to undergo those type of regulation um, in order to go to market. Not to forget that a lot of regu regulations are based currently on the crop protection uh, component. Therefore, a lot of um, hand holding with regulators to bring them onto the biopesticide regulatory framework will also need some time. So therefore, for the industry, as we are working very closely with regulators to understand and get a flexible framework. Of course, we do a partnership with GIZ, for example, is to get that level of consistency so that we can get a regulatory framework that um, we can get products into the hands of farmers at much more quicker pace um, as a pest and disease that comes up. You finish the exploration, know that the efficacy and how do we get to the uh, registration process rather than take a long time. For across Asia, again, going back to the crop protection, it takes us uh, 13 years to get a product into the market, but ASEAN takes another seven years for regulatory requirement before a product can be registered. So there's a full 20 years before you even see a product into the market. So a functional systematic science-based regulation is going to call for us to help support the farming community. So I'm going to stop here for the moment and uh, Alison, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tan, and, and, and it's nice that I've brought you back to your student days as well. I, I think that's a good thing, <laughs> I hope. Um, but that's kind of interesting in that you, you've obviously spent a long time, a lot, uh, well, maybe not that long because you're, you're still very young, but as a career, what, what is the real change that you've seen uh, since your university days? Have, do you, is it as fast as you would have liked to have seen the uptake of biopesticides and biocontrol, for example, or has it been slower? So I think the conversation we need to separate into two components. One is uh, we tend to say small scale farmer, but you, from what I've seen uh, for the semi, semi, semi large scale, like I'll give you a good example is Camera Highland. Camera Highland, the adaptation of bio BT was 100% in Camera Highland in yep. the 1980s. Yeah, already. So I think that we need to look at the farmer capability, the size of farmer, because it goes back into affordability. And therefore, all, be, between different group of farming community, we need to have a different communication and a different, um, what do we call, strategy mm -hmm. um, of how do we bring them on board and introduce the particular innovation, so to speak. It, it, it's not one system for all no no that, that's very insightful and, and but are there different business models then maybe we should be thinking about with uh, small scale farmers for example to be able to adopt some of these technologies that might be required be, because you're, you're saying that if you've got larger scale or semi-large scale there seems to be they've got the purchasing power or they've got the ability to um, uh, work together is that something that we need to look at more do you think I don't think it's a business model, but it's more of how do we uh, how do we um, tack on the government machinery? Again, Caddy has a machinery, a lot of partnership, whether it's Myanmar, et cetera, on the application that they reach out to, um, the whole extension service. Like again, NATAS of China is a good extension uh, format. PPD has a large PP, uh, extension format that you could leverage and be able to explore and, and go out. So. Um, with also various countries are coming up with various, um, you know, over the last 12 months, you see a lot of government investing or, or direct cash investment into supporting the agriculture platform. So I think there's both the, uh, the uh, financial support to make things much more affordable. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, pricing is a different story altogether, meaning is that helping a small holder to get to make, uh, get hold of the technology firsthand and as he increases productivity, then he can be self-reliant and buy his own product. Maybe that's an opportunity for us to, to tag on national machinery to introduce certain technology. Okay, excellent. And so I guess there's a couple of questions related to exactly that. The first one, has the benefit cost ratio of any of the biopesticides recommended for fall armyworm worked out? Um, is MPV a cost-effective method? There's two questions in there for you. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've not um, done so, any social economic review, nor have uh, we gone into that modeling because as I mentioned to you, when I read through the paper, FAO has still said there needs to be 
um, more work to be done to really look at it. And then the whole scaling part is going to be a very different. It's like in Dr. Zhang said, you know, scaling up in certain countries in Myanmar or scaling up in Malaysia, because in Malaysia, probably the bioreactors are available. I can have 100 liters bioreactor available. I have production facility available for scale up. So that cost will become very different compared to if I start up uh, a new manufacturing facility in Myanmar, Cambodia. Uh, India is a good example. There are a lot of facilities, the commercial, you can sort of um, licensing type of licensing a, a facility to go and produce and then you can do your own packaging. So different country will have a different um, costing cost structure, so to speak. Thank you. Yeah. Here's a question. I'm not sure if you know much about the Nagoya protocol, but is that a big hurdle to overcome for the use of biopesticides and biological control agents? Yes, the 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 the, uh, the release to environment is um, very very challenging. That's why I mentioned to you when you bring an organism, a a let's say you know you come from New Zealand or and, and you know the whole biosafe biosecurity agenda, you know. How do I get to Quarantine Act? How do we get Con Biocontrol Act, Environment Protection Conservation Act 1992? And those pieces need to be satisfied and then also a threat to local um, indigenous species. So that whole encompasses a different domain altogether. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's a serious, it's a good question. There's another question here. If a product proved toxic by killing beneficials like biological control agents, can it pass through regulation and be registered? Again, um, it is based on the local requirement. Once you, there is criteria for the toxicity. Again, non, uh, Dr. Zhang also spoke about non-target, over-spectrum, non-target organisms. So those part of things has to be evaluated and assessed by each country's fundamental regulation because everybody have a different set. Yes, we have FAO as a global guideline, but every country has its own uh, science-based criteria for uh, toxicity assessment. Excellent, thank you. And here's, a, here's always the big question around, um, and, and you sort of actually you sort of talked about this before in, in quite some depth, but I'm gonna ask it again, but it's, um, what are the incentives that farmers could get to encourage them to use biopesticides? Because if it is more expensive than the conventional way, which is more toxic, farmers will still consider that way, given the cost and the economic benefit. Well, what, what do you think some of the ways we could incentivize farmers to I think, use? I think people are very hung up on the cost itself, but at, at the end of the day, um, if the biological products are sustainable in the environment, they self -prop propagate number one. They will grow because once they, let's say, the bacterial fudge will infect a bacteria and then will propagate inside and multiply by itself. So you will have a um, sort of a baseline over a season you don't have to consecutively spray it to manage a certain level unless it breaks the threshold or infection. So uh, cost as initial cost is not everything, but it's the whole spectrum of um, efficacy, have different tools, different season. And by having biopesticide, you can also manage your pre-harvest uh, interval. You can really protect your crops to the end before you harvest, as opposed to other chemical, you have to maintain a certain um, timeline, whether it's seven days, three days, or 14 days, depending on what you apply. So, but with this, you can actually, with surveillance, be able to manage your, uh, your pest and disease infection. Yeah. So, and actually, may, maybe that's a, there's some, there's a question here that I think sort of also gets to what you've just said around emphasizing farmer education and implementing conservation biocontrol, actually IPM at the very start. Uh, is, I mean, obviously, the basics of crop management uh, from the very start are a very important part of reducing your cost and reducing the use of uh, any pesticides uh, in the future. Uh, how important is that sort of good soil, good seed, uh, good sort of crop management? How important is that, do you think, in controlling fall armyworm? I think everything has its, has, has its role. And then again, uh, when we talk about pesticide, it's not calendar spring. I think a lot of people mis, uh, misuse this. Again, it goes back to surveillance. If you see a threshold uh, being, being uh, 
been crushed and therefore you implement certain uh, management. So, okay, also you need to balance between when you spray a, a, a crop protection product and when you're putting a biocontrol. So that education needs to be there, but nevertheless, um, with a good agriculture practice and IPM, whether it's um, carbon sequestration, uh, uh, moisture management, these are all part and parcel of the holistic view of why we use, utilize IPM with rotate crop rotation, and then that will also preserve the, uh, you know, encourage nitrogen uh, at, at what we call capture using different crop from corn and nitrogen fixation type. So there are various things that we can help farmer to better, re, uh, better sustainably use their, their farmland in a, in a much more holistic manner. This Excellent. is all the technology that is in place. We need farmers to be able to rotate them. And, and on that, I guess um, you said that biological and synthetic pesticide products are often could can be and are often used together within an IPM system. Um, I mean, this is something we're looking at in the development of the resistance management work under the ASEAN Action Plan. Do you see these synergies there with resistance management, the idea even to explore the sort of rotation or the, the relationship between biologicals and synthetic pesticides? Definitely. Because on one hand, when you have a bio, uh, bio, biologic control, when it exceeds a certain instar, that's why when you do when we do the efficacy test, people don't realize that different crop protection products will target different instar or different growth cycle. So once your threshold passes or you collapse for a particular instar, you need to use uh, more dramatic um, chemical to manage the control, then you can reverse back into biocontrol as part of the ecosystem management and then reintroduce based on surveillance, good agriculture practice and IPM. So there is a coexistence of the technology based on spatial and time. Great, thank you. And that's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. I mean, that was a brilliant presentation and uh, it's really nice to hear the growth uh, in the industry as well uh, in this biologicals um, part of the industry. Um, and I know it's starting from a small share of the marketplace, but it's good it's going in the right direction. So thank you very much for sharing your experience and, and thoughts with us today. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. And I'd like to now welcome our next speaker, Dr. Manjanath from uh, India. Uh, he is the former Vice President of Biocontrol Research Laboratories and former entomologist of the Commonwealth Institute of Biological Control in India. And I'd like to welcome uh, him to, to our webinar. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Alison. Um, you know, my topic will be on microbials. Uh, in, uh, in recent years, there has been an increasing emphasis on organic farming, uh, not only in developing countries, but uh, throughout the world. Biological control actually falls within the, within the purview of organic farming. So we should make use of, make use of this opportunity and try to see how best we can promote a biological control. Next. Uh, I will be speaking about uh, augmentative biological control. Uh, augmentative biological control involves periodical releases of parasitoids and predators in order to manage the pests. So for making that kind of a release, you know, we need large number of natural enemies which will have to be mass produced in the laboratories and made available to farmers for direct releases. So when it comes to using biological control agents for controlling the pests, um, you know, a doubt arises in the minds of the people because farmers have been so used to spraying chemical insecticides, being so, will they be amenable or will they be open to the use of biological approaches. Now, if we review the work that has been done in different parts of the world, we realize that biological control agents have been used extensively in several countries. For example, in countries like the USA, Russia, in some countries in the UK, China, and other places, millions of natural enemies are produced and used every season for controlling a number of pests. And most of them, of course, they are in um, indoors. 
And based on my own experience of establishing a commercial insect tree in India and managing it for over 16 years, I can say without any hesitation that our farmers are willing to use biological controls, biological control methods. So they have no hesitation in using any control measures uh, that are going to benefit them. Next. Um, of course, the farmers are really willing, but the question is, you know, are we, that is those of us who are working in biological control, are we ready to help the farmers in implementing this technology? The question is, are we in a position to supply adequate quantities of parasitoids and predators, even if the farmers are willing to pay for them? Of course, as I mentioned, they are ready, but are we ready? So the answer in most cases is just for pointing no, because we do not have uh, the capacity to supply the required quantities of natural enemies. Next. If you make a reality check, of course, you know, a number of natural enemies, as I mentioned earlier, they have been produced in different parts of the world and used for controlling a variety of pests for more than 50 to 60 years. Next one. Now, the, here is a list of natural enemies that are most commonly commercially produced in different parts of the world and used for controlling pests like the lepidopteran pests, scale insects, white flies, and also some of the beetle pests and others. And uh, for, for the last four to five decades, only these natural enemies, about 15 to 20 natural enemies have been produced and used. And um, there are a number of other natural enemies which have not received adequate attention. That is because see the natural enemies that are being shown in this table, they are very amenable for commercial production and they can be produced on a natural host. And that is why they have received so much of emphasis. But if we look at the, look the other side, next one, Next one. See, there are some of the, these are some of the natural enemies, especially they are very promising in India. For example, there are parasites, egg parasites like the Tastica shinobii, which can be used for controlling Rhizales trembora. And then also the, uh, there are a number of other ones. For example, there is a parasite called uh, Potaisia plutele, which is a larval parasite of a diamondback moth, which natural parasitism sometimes exceeds 80%. But if you give a little more assistance, we will be able to get better control, but they are not being able to mass multiply. They are not mass multiplied because uh, they cannot be multiplied on unnatural hosts. And it is very difficult to undertake production on natural hosts. But here is an opportunity for some of the researchers to spend some time with some of these natural enemies and say how best they can evolve mass production technologies for them so that you know we can include these in the list of natural enemies that can be used for controlling the pests. This increases if you are able to um, produce them, we can actually expand our product range. Next. Uh, when it comes to augmentation, augmentative biological control, you know, there are a number of challenges. See, the first and the foremost challenge is non-availability of required natural enemies in enough quantities for timely releases. And actually this is the greatest hurdle in promoting augmentative biological control. Unless we have enough numbers for releases, we will not be able to control the pest. And also we need to evolve economic mass production, long-term storage, since these are living organisms which cannot be stored for a long time under natural conditions. We have to evolve methods to store them for a long period so that we can augment the stock and use them when, they want, when we want. And then speedy supply and also timely applications, these are some of the important constraints. Production of natural enemies, especially the microbials. When I say microbials, microbials include parasitoids and predators. So production of these biological control agents is really a challenge. More we try to produce, more problems we encounter. And there is tension at every stage. There is uncertainty and challenge at every stage. And it not only restricted to production, it extends until the products reach the destination and until the farmers make use of them in the field. And also it's a huge challenge to match the production and the demand. 
normally we find that when there is a huge production, there is no demand, which is very frustrating. And augmentative biological control works more effectively if it is adopted on a large area, on a large scale. Therefore, we must convince the growers and the growers association to adopt this augmentative biological control collectively on a large area. Um, if you are running a commercial insectary, and if you have received some confirmed orders, and suddenly if there is a cancellation of order, you know, it will be very frustrating because it will lead to a loss of valuable materials that is parasitized and predators, and also there will be a lot of um, money. And in countries like India, where the agricultural land holdings are highly fragmented, here actually a farmer owns only about two to three acres. And that being the case, in a small area, there will be a number of farmers growing a variety of crops. So in such cases, it's very difficult to induce augmentative biological control or any other uniform agricultural technology, agricultural practices on a large scale. Therefore, we need to interact with the local leaders and the governments and seek their help in promoting augmentative biological control with certain incentives to farmers. So we have to actually promote them. And um, I would like to make certain uh, recommendations. See, there is a tendency to establish a big biofactory to undertake the production of parasites and predators. It is not desirable. So instead of undertaking the production of parasites and predators at one or two major centers and then distributing them, it is better to have a number of production units at various locations. And they can concentrate on the production of biological control agents to cater to the local needs, to cater to the pests that are available there and the crops. And this largely helps in overcoming problems related to storage, transport, et cetera. And also being in a small area, concentrating on a small area, we can actually interact with the growers and win their confidence. We should, it is necessary that we have regular interaction with the growers. And when we undertake that kind of a decentralized production, it is better we choose uh, the local strains of the parasites and predators because they are already accl acclimatized to the area and better adopted and we can expect better results from them. And this involves establishing a large number, maybe, maybe a few thousand insect trees. So if that is the case, you know, then agricultural graduates, you know, who look for jobs elsewhere, they can actually take it as a challenge and establish insect trees in critical areas and take up the production of one or two very promising biological control agents and they can employ themselves. It generates, it generates actually commercial insect trees generate, generates employment opportunities. And there has to be a public private partnership. In order to promote organic farming, we find that the government spends a lot of money. And we should also ask the government to spend money on augmented biological control. The local government uh, may identify, for example, certain crops and pests in an area and announce that they are willing to place confirmed orders for supply of required biological control agents. If such assured business is available, then several industries or individuals may come forward to set up commercial insect trees. The government may procure these biocontrol agents and make them available to the farmers. In fact, in India, the government has come forward and it has actually promoted the biopesticide industry, including the commercial insect trees. So this will create, because the, the cooperation between the government, the commercial insect tree and the farmers will create a win-win situation for all of them. And uh, actually, this is how a public-private par partnership can work. Next. Just have one more minute, uh, yeah. Dr. Manjana. So we have to produce uh, you know, orders in advance and you know, take up the production. So that helps in actually you know, planning our production and make suitable uh, uh, releases. So in case of live materials like parasites and predators, the products ought to be sold even before they are produced. And marketing needs to be done along with the technology. Next. You know, in view of the fact that there are certain major pests which appear regularly on certain crops, 
And, you know, we can actually recommend biological control agents to be released on a routine basis. Such releases should be undertaken in the beginning of the season itself before the pest becomes very serious. So this would help us in complementing the existing natural enemy populations and achieving better control. Some such minimum releases should be treated as the routine agricultural practices, such as, for example, irrigation, fertilizer application, weeding, et cetera. So such practice should be promoted by the government. Next. And biological control alone may not work. And we need to, for, for example, being specific, they may be able to exert control of a particular pest. We have to control a pest complex as a whole. In such cases, we should adopt integrated pest management with biological control as a major trust. We should deploy pheromones for identifying the pest, use chiromones or suitable flowering plants to retain the released natural enemies in the same vicinity where they are released. We can use biopesticides, botanicals, etc., to control some of the pests. And we should fully make use of the insect resistant transgenic crops as a major component of IPM because these are compatible with biological control. Next. And we can also use molecular tools to enhance the biological traits of some of the beneficial organisms. And integrated pest management is the most prudent approach. We should try to exploit any control measure that is beneficial to us because integrated pest management, after all, it is nothing but the intelligent pest management. So with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Yes, Thank thanks. you very much. Yes, no, yeah. sorry. I just <laughs> took a while to unmute myself. Uh, it's the technology uh, issue I have. I'm not fast with it. But listen, thank you so much for that presentation. And I know that you actually even had another slide around the challenges to be overcome. Um, that will be in the slide set for everyone to see when we share that. Um, but there was okay. a lot There was a lot if, to if think. You can, if you can move to that slide, I, it, it's a summary of whatever I mentioned. Exactly. So, yes, so these are some of the challenges that we have to overcome. That is efficient and economic mass production, ready availability of natural enemies, and we have to expand the product range so that we will be able to deal with uh, several pests and prolong shelf life to augment stock and use them as and when they are required. Yeah. And we have to demonstrate the efficacy of biological control agents, and then we have to manage the habitat. For example, I mentioned that we have to encourage flowering plants to attract the uh, parasites or predators. And public-private partnership, I have explained how the governments can extend help in, procure, in encouraging biological control practices. And then we have to make proactive releases as a routine practice so that we don't allow the pest to become economically damaging. And then, as I mentioned, that biological control should be used as a major trust in integrated pest management approach. So this, is my, this was the summary. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. It was very detailed. Um, yeah. And I think uh, we've got quite a few questions coming in. One is, um, do you have examples of sound business models for decentralized commercial insectaries for the purpose of production for augmentative releases of natural enemies, especially targeting subsistence farmers? Um, if yes, can can you share some of these examples? I, I mean, you, you mentioned something like a, a mini huge amount of insectaries that could be possibly put around a, a country. Do you have any, is there smaller scale models in India that, that you have seen that work well? Yes. Uh, see, for example, there is a pest of uh, a coconut called coconut black-headed caterpillar, which has been very effectively managed by releasing a larval parasitoid. Uh, for, 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 uh, for nearly, this practice has been there for the last three to four uh, decades. And then um, we can control uh, a mealybug attacking the grapevine by releasing a predaceous coccinated beetle. So it effectively controls that. And also there are certain myriad bugs which can be used for controlling a sucking pests like aphids and uh, white flies. So these are some of the examples that are available. And then of course, on a larger scale, Pests like, um, on a larger scale, pests like uh, uh, sugarcane borers, cotton bollworms. So they have been, their, their, their efficacy have been demonstrated and used on a wide scale. 
Okay, and and tell me who 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 pays who pays for that? I mean, you sort of suggested, I think, before around, I guess, government support to actually help yeah. even out this lumpiness of supply and demand. But is there, for example, scope? Uh, Keith Jones is asking this for smallholder farmers, um, potentially farmer associations, sharing the cost of large scale release. Is there any models like that that have been used where farmers are sort of See, the government gave support uh, for implementing integrated pest management, which included uh, the purchase of parasites and predators, and also the pheromones, and uh, also the microbials like nuclear polyhydrosis virus. And uh, the central government, you know, in India, we have central government and then the state governments. The central government has given funds to the state governments in order to procure these uh, biopesticides from the insect trees and give them to the farmers at a highly subsidized rates. And the farmers use them in the field. See, the farmers are open to using biopesticides because they have not been able to get the control of some of the major pests by using insecticides where they have developed resistance. Yeah. So I've got another question here and it's around the use, you mentioned at the very end, and this wasn't the, the main part of your um, uh, presentation, but I, I was quite interested around the use of molecular tools to improve the beneficial traits of natural enemies, such as yeah. temperature tolerance, yeah. could be a good option in the future. But is this quite expensive, do you think? I mean, and are there other issues that arise in, no, in improving the, the current traits? Uh, you see, for example, we can, uh, we can actually enhance the beneficial traits like host searching ability and then uh, host um, you know, resistance to uh, some of the pesticides. And uh, so some of these and some of the and enhancing the shelf life, some of these can be probably um, we can achieved by using the molecular tails, especially with uh, the CRISPR technology that is available, probably it is possible for us to enhance the beneficial traits so that you know that we will be empowering the uh, biological control agent so that they can perform better. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. We need to move on to our next speaker. But Mr. Manjanath, that was an excellent presentation. I really liked the, 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 the list there of, of the potential pests that could be used as well. I mean, sorry, potential, um, what am I thinking of? Insects there for, for um, uh, controlling fall army worm or other pests, sorry. That's what I was meaning. And I was wondering if you can see the question and answers box, um, if you feel like answering any of the questions that many of our um, participants have, we, we would love you to just go on there and, and feel free to answer any of their questions. Um, yeah. I, I think they so made one, some specific ones. One last ones point you. I would like to add is, Yes. Uh, that you know, biological control uh, cannot be applied for all the pests. Yep. For example, if there is a pest like fall or remove, which appears generally in an in, in, uh, outbreak proportion, yep. uh, it may not be possible to handle that kind of a pest by releasing uh, parasites and predators. You know, yep. they take a little more time to build up the population to control the pest, by which time the pest would have already caused the damage. Yep. So uh, we should bring down the population of fall army worm by using other technologies. And then to maintain its population at a very low level, we can resort to augmentative releases of parasites or predators. I think that's a very good point. And, and we're yeah. definitely, I think, taking an integrated pest management approach that considers all the tools in the toolbox uh, according to the situation and context is, is very important. So thank you for making that point. Perfect. And thank you very much for presenting. And if, if you have the chance to go on the Q&A and ask uh, or answer any people's questions, sure. um, please do so. So thank you very much. And, and I'm going to move quickly to our next speaker because I know we have a bit of a time pressure here, but no problems. Um, we can make it up. Um, but Dr. Rika Joy from URI um, will be speaking to us now about scaling up biocontrol for fall armyworm. Uh, and encouraging us to think beyond um, to communication and extension, I guess, or even beyond that. So Rika, you're welcome to start. I hope that we can hear you now because I know you had a few problems at the start. Are you with us? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Welcome. Do you hear me okay? Perfectly. All right. Um, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Indeed, I'm talking about scaling up biocontrol and as our earlier um, speakers have, have emphasized, Scaling up biocontrol, um, re indeed, it means that we have to share biological control 
the knowledge, the, the tools, how to use it, all of these are important to communicate or to reach to the farmers. But it is not enough to end with that um, reaching the farmers. So next slide, please. Why? Because the context in most of Asia, and I'm taking the case of Cambodia, is that there is an existing network that already there's an existing technology that's already easy for the farmers to use. And I, early on in the, when uh, fall army worm was predicted to arrive in Asia, we were at, in a process of starting an um, interview with the industry, uh, pesticide industry. And we interviewed um, bigger importers, um, medium scale and small sellers of pesticides. And they had many different narratives. Uh, some are more laid back, oh, don't worry, we have a product for that or this outbreak will not happen every year, or some are also very more trigger happy. Oh, this is a very smart pest, we need more products. And some are looking into the economics um, of it, that, that more farmers will buy more products and they will gain. So this is not to say that uh, we are putting the, the industry as other um, and, and making a dichotomy here. But what I want to emphasize is that an established network is already providing information and they are quite effective in giving the products, also looking at incentives. And many of them have already products for fall armyworm. They have a strategy for it. But there are a few uh, out of 57 companies, only three mentioned IPM. And none of them, even though there were companies that were also selling organic and biologicals, none of them recommended these for fall armyworm. So um, when we probe further, they were saying that they were uh, actually interested in this and want to know more. What can they sell? What product can they provide to the farmers? So here, there is also an opportunity at the industry side um, that, that is um, looking or, or interested in biological. But the point is that we need a multi-pronged action for biocontrol. Next, please. Um, this is uh, looking back at IPM constraints from the case of IPM. Um, we did a review of all the, the adoption constraints of IPM, and there are constraints that are common across the globe. Um, but there are also constraints more specific to the global south where we are. And if we look at this, we, are, we know quite well constraints about knowledge for IPM, knowledge about the pests, and the beneficials, um, preferences involving users, um, the conflicts uh, between and, and the power, the influence of the pesticide industry, the availability of cheap pesticides as uh, constraining um, the, the I, I, adoption of IPM. Also, the, at the technology side, developing IPM further, uh, integrating it with uh, knowledge and, and other existing technologies that uh, are, are useful for the farmers. At the policy level, there are risk averse policies as an unwieldy uh, regulatory condition. And then also at the culture, the way that we, or uh, not only researchers, but also the farmers and the extension, all of uh, these, how they interact together and how they behave, um, there are also constraints there. So uh, next slide, please. What can we learn from the experience of IPM in the scaling of biocontrol options? Next, the first one that I want to focus on is something that has been shared in this series uh, very uh, strongly to sharpen the ecological literacy of, of farmers and, and farming communities. Why? Um, there is a, a pesticide focused narrative that uh, we need to protect the yield, but at the expense of or at a lower value um, for the conserving of natural enemies, for conserving um, the beneficials uh, that are out there that could provide ecosystem services. And we need to highlight that value a lot more. I mean, going back to that example of, of the interviews with the pesticide companies, um, we asked them uh, for fall armyworm, what were your products? And they, they listed this. And when we compare this against literature, we find that there are some that were indeed um, considered to have uh, efficacy for fall armyworm, but there are many of them that are highly hazardous, that are high risk. And 
this is something that the farmers uh, often forget. And this is really a, a, an important avenue where the biologicals can provide um, that uh, literacy and that value for farmers to minimize this risk to their health and to the environment. Um, next slide, please. Now, often we also think of um, communicating or scaling as technology transfer. And the point is that technology just does not transfer. It does not move from place to place, but instead it is embedded in the social structures, in the material conditions, the tools, the, the ecological situation, and also the practices that are existing. And what do I mean? Let me take the case of um, trichoderma um, that we use for rice. Now, uh, not full armyworm example, but it's quite, um, I think it's quite useful when we're thinking about uh, biologicals as well. Um, we started working with trichoderma, um, testing it together with the farmers and they over uh, some time, they gave feedback. Uh, they were quite critical of it uh, in terms of cost, in terms of indeed um, how easy to use it, when to apply it. Um, it blocks the sprayer nozzles, um, how to do, how to manage those things. Over time, however, there were other um, uh, stakeholders, such as uh, a manufacturer of a cedar, uh, the cedar that you see in the picture here. And this manufacturer started to put trichoderma as the free product for this uh, cedar. If you buy the cedar, I will give you free trichoderma. And I will also teach you that you need to, uh, to use the cedar, you need lower seed rate. You also need to use trichoderma uh, seed treatment in this and that way. So doing so made the trichoderma sort of a part of the routine of doing using the cedar. Um, in another case, we also found another uh, farmer that uh, made a modification to the tool so that it's not just seeding services, but he also has a spraying service and he can spray um, biological uh, using the same sort of machine, but modified. So in that sense, the farmers are now receiving many different um, angles of the use of the biological, but um, one that's coming from a manufacturer, one that's coming from the service provider for spraying, and another maybe from the researcher or from the extension staff teaching about um, biological. In that sense, you are aligning the message and embedding the use of the technology in the routine of the farmer. So farmers and other stakeholders need to be involved to really adapt the, the practices. And this makes, uh, I guess, the cost to the farmer a little bit less because the informational cost, the transactional cost becomes um, part of the other uh, routines of other stakeholders as well. Um, next slide, please. Another um, way is something that the other speakers have already explained, and I will not talk so much about this, but uh, one of the constraints of IPM is the silo. Uh, I am a researcher on insects. I will do this one. I am a, a researcher on, on nematodes. I will work on this one. And our routines are often in silos. But uh, I was inspired by this model from Be Heard, and which is really um, design thinking, starting with um, what is it that the, the end users would need and what uh, can I offer? And, and given our products, um, can we try and prototype? Can we test this? But then beyond that, we there's that knowledge innovation that we can do as researchers, but then we also expose this knowledge to other, um, to other um, stakeholders and let the system innovate or develop or, or in simple terms to tinker um, on these technologies. Some, in some ways, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, maybe it's a non-commercial pathway for, for the technology. Maybe it's about laboratories, that a network of laboratories that governments or, or projects need to support um, to pro pro produce and to um, give training and to um, allow the farmers to access it. But maybe there are also products that can be commercialized, that can be further 
um, manufactured and, and as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, still a long way to package this, to make sure that quality is good, to market this, and then to allow the users to um, access this product. So that kind of, of routine is also part of our role as researchers to uh, engage um, the other stakeholders with the sort of uh, biologicals that we have. Um, the next one is also engaging policymakers later on. And we've talked a lot about um, regulations and indeed in some countries in Asia, uh, there is more regulation and there's more acceptability for, for um, biological control, but in, also in some countries, it's, it's still um, in the process. So what is needed from research is this data-driven um, information and key messages that we need to share to the policymakers, because for the most part, the government is very open and very willing to find solutions uh, sustainable solutions, but they need to know what are the risks, how can this be managed, how can it be tested, how can it be regulated. And as we are doing our own tests, if we bring them along with us, take them to our fields, um, support the linkages between or the, the, the discussions between the policymakers and the biocontrol industry and allow them to, to um, engage and, and talk with the farmers also, uh, provide space for this kind of discussions. That uh, supports then the policymakers to uh, know more about biologicals and then see how they can regulate it, how they can support it. Um, so in conclusion, how do we scale up biological control? And my simple answer would be, we need to align varied aspects of innovation. So from knowledge, um, from the farming practices, how to em embed this in the routines of farming, um, linking with the other intermediaries, supporting that kind of industry, supporting the creation of enabling policies, all of these have to align, and then we can help to scale uh, biological control. That said, um, thank you, Alison, and thank you, everybody. Sorry, I'm back again and thank you so much, Rika. And I'm just gonna um, ask everyone, we're gonna probably go uh, five minutes late today. So I'm very sorry about that, but we've got some wonderful speakers and I, I do want time to to um, ask questions. Um, Rika, that, that was really interesting. You touched on so many important points. Um, I really liked this whole idea of uh, technology doesn't necessarily mean transfer. <laughs> Because I think technology transfer gets talked about all the time, but I'm not sure that it actually gets transferred very well often to smallholder farmers. And I really liked those examples, um, how important it is to put it into sort of the habit or actually allow the farmers to innovate uh, as well and, and then think about the problem from their side. I mean, is that happening, do you think, in, with fall armyworm? I mean, you, you gave some rice examples, and I know rice is the crop that you're mostly focusing on. Are you seeing that sort of education sort of growing amongst farmers around fall armyworm and sort of interest there and in trying new uh, products, etc., cetera, in biocontrol, or is it still too early? Is there still too much work to be done? I think it is a bit too early. Um, uh, farmers are very much open to, as uh, um, the earlier speakers have said, um, there is demand for biological control for other solutions, um, uh, products out there. But um, when it comes to uh, changing the practice, uh, the behavior, um, there seems to be a lot more risk to using biological control than the standard routine of the farmer, which was already from the very beginning start spraying. So, so when we um, um, try to communicate that to the farmers, we need to also communicate it to the other stakeholders, like uh, would they have uh, access to it? Can they buy this product? And who will sell it to them? Um, those uh, other, um, um, stakeholders also have to be present um, for the risk to the farmer to become lower. Yeah, no, that's very important. So how, how do you get stakeholders from across the system, do you think, talking to each other? What are some of the ways that you've seen that work well? 
Um, we've, we've worked before with GIZ as well on a national biocontrol forum uh, mm -hmm. that worked very well in terms of really bringing out uh, the concerns of the concerns of the private sector and allowing also the government to respond. What is it that we need? Um, how do we <clears throat> move together to address those needs? Um, or what kind of data do we need? How do we, how do, we do this? And I, I think that was very um, useful. Um, to, to continue. Um, at, at the level of the farmers, a lot of these um, interactions that we do is called, we call it a, a, a trade fair. So mm -hmm. just let, allowing the private sector to be there uh, as uh, we end the season and the farmers uh, observe the, the trial plots, but they also get to talk to the private sector. Um, oh, okay. and, and many of those discussions was just so how can I buy this product? Can I get a discount? Uh, how does your product work? And, and these kind of discussions then move towards, uh, oh, I want to tinker with this product. I want to develop this uh, together. And they um, themselves make those decisions. And we were just providing them the platform to come to discuss. So that interaction is, is obviously extremely valuable when they're talking about the products and, and the technologies and actually trying to understand how they might work with the actual industry people there. And, and I mean, that research that you presented at the very start, I mean, that was very much at the start, uh, quite early on. Um, and, and so do you feel, though, that the industry, if you were to redo that survey now, do you feel like you would get different results? Um, I, I have the feeling that maybe the industry will have learned um, also of the existence of other products. Um, in terms of Cambodia, there's still the limitation in terms of um, importing and, and selling um, yeah. biological control. So, so I think there is still that, that uh, limitation, but there is certainly uh, a lot more uh, awareness and interest. For, for organic, for safe uh, food, for, for uh, providing products that are more sustainable to the farmers. So from the industry side, um, I think there's also maybe a sharper, I think during that time, we saw they had a lot of products, they would sell a lot of products, but in terms of really knowing what whole army worm was, there were many that didn't know what it was. So I think maybe that- You, mean, what, you mean within the industry? within the industry. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah and, there well, was a lot of confusion on uh, the common army worm or uh, other pests um, okay. versus this new pest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A uh, question here. So um, how, how do you, I mean, actually you've sort of touched upon this and, and many of the other speakers as well, um, particularly um, the speaker before you, but farmers are actually willing to use biocontrol um, other than the trade fairs, for example, and, and talking to farmers that way, what are the, the other ways that you think we need to uh, focus on to have more farmer uptake of biocontrol? Uh, one of the things that I've seen uh, from our case on IPM, not whole army worm yet, but uh, from our case um, on the making these products available, uh, the industry uh, from companies that we just invited to join us, um, they've also over time uh, diversified. They now have a, like a small office or some staff working in the province. They now have retail. Um, these sort of networks really allow the farmers to access the product and, and make it cheaper for them. Because otherwise, early on, uh, when it was just us and some uh, seller in the capital, the farmer would have to go to the capital and find the product himself. So that's very high transactional cost for the farmer. But when the industry learned that, okay, as we go along with this project, with these sites, uh, they might have a market, they, uh, we, are, we might have a scope to sell here. We assign someone there to talk with the farmers so often. And that also creates a network for the farmers to be able to access it. Excellent. Well, that's a very good spot to end on, Rika. Thank you so much for that presentation and for all your help across the series. Uh, it certainly has been a learning opportunity for all of us, and we're glad that you're along on the journey with us. And I think that's really important, just that interaction, uh, building the network is so important at a community level, regional level, um, country 
uh, and then regional across Southeast Asia and, and more broadly. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop there and move on. We're going to be five minutes late, everyone, um, maybe even less, because I'm going to speed through the last bit. I sort of put together a bit of a summary just based on everyone's presentations and talking to them beforehand. Um, so I had, because I had a bit of an advanced view, of course, but there's lots of things that have come up today in people's um, presentations. I think it's, uh, it, I love this thing at the start uh, with the first presentation, that everyone loves biologicals, but I think what's really important um, is that even though it's a growing market, as Dr. Tan pointed out, we all agree there's probably a lot of work to be done to make them accessible, um, to make them more cost effective, to make them more effective at doing their job, and importantly, actually used by more farmers in the field. Another highlight for me is really around developing cost effective biological control products that require or have farmer input from the very start so that we're thinking about how do farmers use this, um, how can farmers incorporate it into their uh, everyday habits, I guess, what, what Rika was talking about. Um, and I think part of that is making sure that researchers, innovators, regulators, they need to involve farmers and understand their needs to be able to best uh, meet the solutions um, that can be used in the field. Uh, many of our speakers touched upon the need to really transform the system and disseminate biocontrol approaches um, and develop them in a systemic way, requiring changes around education, the way we re do research, business, farm level practices, and the regulatory system that enables uh, biocontrol. So I think that is another important point. Um, and I think it needs to take into account what Dr. Tan also said, that there's often significant investment requirements at the start and the development of many of these new solutions. So we really need to understand how we can catalyze and support innovation and uptake, including in sectories, uh, for example, but across the value chain. And it has to be affordable for farmers in the end and practical for them to use. So um, I think this really, you know, underscores what's important in the ASEAN action plan is we do need to get stakeholders across the system to talk to each other. We need to understand those different perspectives and needs. I think it's really important what Rika said. Uh, now other speakers around getting people to talk to each other and building those networks um, that came through very strongly in all the presentations. I think understanding the established or current system for managing pests, including the industry and education um, to farmers is, is is vital um, and I uh, would have to say that we'll soon be launching a consultation on developing programs on biocontrol and pharma communication and if you're interested in being involved in those programs please contact me it's very much um, in line with that idea that we all need to get around the table and think about what can work and where can we do better and how can we improve systems. Uh, and finally, I'll end with actually two comments. I, I, the Dr. Manjanath uh, had, uh, I integrated pest management equals intelligent pest management. I love that. I also love uh, Rika's one, sharpen ecological literacy. I thought that was very nice as well. So that brings us to the close. I'm just going to say a big plug for 8th of April, we're moving to a discussion on biopesticide trials. It'll be a great, another great presentation. Um, and before we leave, we'd really like you just to take part in a very brief satisfaction survey. I would like to say thank you for everyone for joining us to our wonderful speakers uh, and also to Pranav who's been helping at the back end today. As always, great job Pranav. Um, and I really hope that you can join us in the next session, but also contact me um, and, and share any of your views. Uh, we're, we're always keen to hear what you've got to say and how you might be interested in helping the program. Uh, I wish you all well, take care, good health, and I will see you on the 8th of April. Thank you very much.